<laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I hope everybody was able to enjoy some delicious oysters. We have monkfish stew. We had some great snacks that Heather uh, made from a, a calendar that the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association did a couple of years ago. Um, so hope you got to enjoy some of those and nope, they're still out. So it would not be offended at all if you got up to get a snack. I appreciate that. So I'm Monique Coombs. I'm the director of community programs for the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. Um, this is the fourth part of a series that we've been doing, living and working in a waterfront community. This is a partnership with the Harpswell Heritage Land Trust uh, at Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, my organization, our organization, uh, the Cundies Harbor Library, the Holbrooks Foundation, and the Harpswell Anchor, and of course, the Cundies Harbor Library. Yeah, I'm sorry if I said that twice. We good? We good. We got everybody. So thank you so much to all of our partners um, for helping us put this on. This isn't, although it's the last of this series, it's not the end of it. We definitely have been um, inspired by these conversations to keep going and come up with new topics. Uh, so if you have any ideas or thoughts or questions on things that you'd like us to talk about, please feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, so this evening, we're gonna be talking about etiquette on the water. And I'm gonna let our panel uh, introduce themselves and then we'll just get right into the conversation. This is pretty informal. So if you have an urgent question that needs ans answering, feel free to raise your hand. If we can, we'll call on you, but we'll also have some time for questions and conversation at the end. So um, Jordy, you wanna kick us off? Sure, so my name is Jordy St. John. I, there we go. Um, I, <laughs> There's on. Okay, can you hear me now? No? All right, I can talk pretty loudly. How about that? <laughs> um, so, like, I, my name is Jordy St. John. I work for the Maine Island Trail Association, otherwise known as MIDA. Um, that's my full time job. I'm actually the business engagement manager for Maine Island Trail Association. I also oversee their boat donations program. Um, and then my kind of side hobby, if you will, is I'm actually an oyster farmer in the New Meadows River. Uh, just over two, almost two and a half years ago now, we formed the New Meadows River Shellfish Cooperative, which is a group of 11 different growers that all farm as far south as Small Point Harbor, Cape Small, and up in through to the Grenette Bridge, uh, Long Reach in that area as well, but mostly within the New Meadows body of water. I'm Jay McGowan. I am a sports fishing charter captain and a main guide. And I also operate my daughter's uh, 32 foot lobster boat and take out tours for lobster um, for people to see how lobstering is done. Uh, I grew up here on oars in Bailey Island. And uh, so I'm pretty familiar with the waters around this area. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Coombs. I'm from Ors Island, Maine, and I go lobstering. Um, me and my brother have our own business, and I also go fishing with my dad. Did you mention the oysters were from you tonight, too? Uh, yes, those were all from the New Meadows <laughs> River Shellfish Co-op. So I hope you enjoyed them. And if you didn't, don't tell me. No. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to mention to um, people on Zoom, thank you for joining. Feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll try to communicate them to us as we're going through this too. So I think the best place to start probably is, um, I'm sure if you live in Harpsville, you've noticed it's starting to get a little bit busy. Um, so let's talk about what it's like uh, on the water during the summertime. So Jay, would you start us? How's your business I, pick up? Well, it's really pick up. I'm, actually, I had my first tours today um, my first lost to tours today. I haven't started charter fishing yet. Uh, that will be next week or so. But uh, I live on the very, very end of Oars Island, uh, opposite the end of the Cripstone Bridge. And so I have a perfect view of Will's Gut and the boat traffic back and forth through Will's Gut. And Will's Gut is an interesting area because the gut itself is... Uh, has daylight markers on it, daytime markers, a red and green marker. People coming from the east almost never see them and go across the ledges headed directly for the opening of the bridge, which is easy to see. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I have been married for 45 years and been involved in that. And my wife grew up in that cottage and 
uh, my daughter uh, and now her daughter have gone out and picked up pieces of various outwoods that have <laughs> left, been left there on the ledges. Uh, it's, a, it's a really a serious problem. Uh, I've talked to the town um, have a master about additional marking and uh, uh, signage or whatever to prevent people. It's gotten last summer, I know for sure that uh, in one case, the, um, what do you call it, the, the ambulance people had to come and attend to a couple of people out there because they got their faces kind of smashed when they hit the ledges at, at a high speed. Uh, it's a, so it, it's, a, it's a dangerous area and I don't think it's controlled enough. Uh, I think the problem is that we just don't have enough wardens to patrol a lot of the areas uh, and slow people down. In them. Um, I did a little investigating today just for the fun of it because I was pretty sure I knew the rules, but uh, if people are within 200 feet of any shoreline, including islands and ledges, that's supposed to be going head speed or idle speed. So when they go out past an island, like Ragged Island, they're supposed to be going, you know, very, very slow. And certainly coming into the, a lot of times you see people come in and those that know where the gut is, go through it full speed right up to the bridge and then they shut down and they go through. That didn't seem to be a problem many years ago, but now on the west side of the bridge, we have a uh, kayak uh, launching area and a business that runs kayaks. We have a lot of people coming down through that bridge that are not very experienced uh, in the water in general, but don't seem to know that they should, uh, if anything, get through the bridge as quickly as possible and then get out of the channel. Uh, and I don't mean to be mean about that, but they're really, when you have, 25 or 30 boats, kayaks coming down through that bridge in a long, thin line of people, then someone in a lobster boat that's got to get his catch in at a certain time is kind of impatient. Mm -hmm. and, and there's been issues between lobstermen and the kayakers. And I think it's more a lack of um, mutual respect for each other that has caused the problem. Have you seen issues in Will's gut going up over the past few years, or has it been consistent? Oh, yes. oh spray yeah. Sort of it started earlier this year. Uh, I'm not sure how many uh, are aware, but uh, when a storm took down both of the daylight uh, markers that had been there for years, it, at first it laid them down flat, and then within a few days they broke off completely. Yeah. So for I don't know, probably three months this winter there were. Uh, While well, they did anchor a buoy out there for a while. But there's really no, it was quite a long time before the town put those back. Those markers are not Coast Guard markers. Those are put there by the town of Harpsville. And I think on the chart it says, um, it, it has a term like uh, locally maintained markers or something like that. So the Coast Guard does not recognize anything through the bridge as far as being a navigable channel. Uh, the markers on the west side of the bridge, which are floating markers, and all the way out to Cox's Ledge, are all uh, put there by the town of Harpsall. They're uh, along where the um, yacht club is, where the channel is out there. Uh, there are two slow down type markers, they're called, they're uh, uh, speed markers that tell people to slow down to idle speed, but there's nothing on the east side of the bridge, uh, uh, going east or coming from the east, that slows people down uh, going through there. Jordy, what about on the New Meadows? Are there issues with speed or? Yeah, so within the New Meadows River, a lot of it is, is pretty open. Um, but when you get up into some of the different coves and I can, if you're boating and you happen to be boating by an oyster farm, because we all know there's more and more oyster farms out there these days, like. I would highly recommend, please stop in and say hi, first of all, nobody's gonna get upset or yell at you if you stop by an oyster farm. Um, and, you know, when you do see somebody tending to their oyster cages, just like, you know, if they're out lobstering, like try to go right by them with a big wake because that does not help us a whole lot as we're trying to 
you know, lean over the side of a boat and uh, do a little bit of work. But um, yeah, the, I think that the headway speed thing, you know, and just being, I, I would just echo the, the being aware of your surroundings when you're boating is the biggest thing. Um, you know, as obviously as an oyster farmer, but also somebody who does pleasure boating as well. Like I love to go out and cruise around with my family. I think the biggest thing that I'm trying to teach my 10 and eight year old is just to really kind of be aware of everything that's around you. And there's a lot of boats around you. You could slow down a little bit. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing for us as farmers is just trying to, you know, know that we are happy to engage and interact because it is something that's kind of newish to the area. So we definitely want to get off on the right foot with people. So feel free to stop in and, and say hi. What about you, Jocelyn? How is speed impact like you and your brother when you're out fishing? Um, speed around me and my brother on our boat is a very big deal. Um, I've noticed a lot of people go really fast by us and some boats don't throw as big of wakes, but the ones that do that are going fast, they really rock us and being in our 21 foot privateer, we rock back and forth quite a bit. And um, it kind of, I'm like, when it does happen, I'm like, Riley, hold on, just because it's a little scary just rocking back and forth. Um, so I definitely think when people see us working, uh, they should definitely slow down just for the safety of us and for other fishermen out there. I realized that I forgot to mention, and if you've been to our series, you know, so I have a fishing family. My husband's a fisherman. This is my daughter, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> and the last names and just, so I, I thought I should mention that just for, for anything. Um, I have something to add to what Jocelyn yeah, said. Yeah, go ahead, Jay. Uh, it, this just happened about three days ago. I was setting traps with my granddaughter, who was 11 years old, and learning the, she has a student permit, and she's working her way towards getting a license and so forth. And we were setting traps. People don't realize that people that are engaged in lobstering, particularly when they're hauling their traps, they are, 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 are taking the small ones out, measuring they're looking down at the floor, they're making sure their feet aren't in the line, they're measuring lobsters, they're baiting the traps. They're not looking around at, at the horizon and seeing boats going by them. Usually, it's been my experience, the boat goes by and, that, and you realize it after they've gone by. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, you're hit with a big wake. And that happened just to the east of Will's gut a couple of days ago with my granddaughter and I, I hauled it, I hold up, grabbed something because she was, uh, had a lobster in her hand and was trying to measure it. And that takes, when she's 11 years old, that takes two hands and so forth. So she just was able to grab something and hold on. But the boat we're in is, it, it's not like a 21 foot, it's a 32 foot. And this was like a 30 foot uh, twin screw power boat, a twin outboard power boat came out of Will's gut and then nailed it and threw about a seven foot wake. And it was very, I felt it was very dangerous. Uh, even though my, my granddaughter, because of her age, uh, wears a life vest. And I also wear suspenders because of my age now. <laughs> so, so, but it still is, it's a really serious thing to make sure that when, as a power boater, uh, as you're going by somebody that's engaged in commercial fishing, just as it says in here, you have the right of way as a commercial fisherman, you're doing a job, you, you know, you need to be, uh, people that are there recreationally need to be respectful of these people that are making their living out of the water. Jay, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, you can't i've never been in a situation where i can even speak to anybody other than scream at them as they go <laughs> how about you jocelyn you, you don't get much chance to well they generally know because a lot of times you see them looking back to see how much of a, what their wake did the damage that they, their wake did and I brought this today. This is, uh, this is uh, a boater's guide for the state of Maine. It's, they, they used to come on every life jacket. When you bought a life jacket, right. recreational life jacket, you used to get one of these. I don't know if you do now or not. It's been a while since I bought a life jacket. 
but it clearly states in here that if somebody's uh, uh, of their occupation is commercial fishing, or if they're even uh, anchored or anything of that sort, you're supposed to control your speed. So, at, oh, and going by docks and wakes and so forth. You, you know, you, you go by a, a dock that's got a boat tied up to it and throw a great big wake and the boat's jumping around and everything and it gets damaged. You're really liable for that if somebody was able to take down your, your name and notify, you know, a Marine Patrol officer or something. They'd have to look into that. You know, so. so how have you handled speed when that's happened? Um, most of the time, I'm going to be honest, I kind of just yell at them, even though I know they're not going to hear me. Um, <laughs> um, I've thought about, I don't know, making a flag that's like slow down if you see us working, but I don't know how well received that would be either if people would even be able to read it. Um, it is difficult to tell people to slow down while you're working just because one, they're either not going to see you very well or they're just not going to care. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's no doubt that it, this knife cuts both ways because there's uh, a lot of fishermen that uh, are not very respectful of uh, recreational fishermen. Um, I often say they, they seem like because they're lobster fishermen, they own the ocean. They don't. <laughs> Yeah, you got to give room for the recreational people as well as, you know, the other, you are the lobster. You know, most lobster fishermen are pretty good around other fish and, and you will speak to them ashore because probably you know who they are. And if you say, hey, look, the next time you see me with a load of traps, slow down, you know, don't do it again. And usually they'll take that pretty well, you know, but uh, I, I've seen them come through the bridge as I, I, there's two or three guys that I know for a fact, they don't care who's in that bridge. They, they're going wide open, they're commercial fishermen. Well, I think that's the point of the sessions like this too, is just sharing information, communication opportunities for talking with each other. I think the other the issue is sort of, we've seen Harpswell get busier and busier, especially in the last decade, especially during the summer seasons. And so we're having to share spaces in new and different ways than have been um, historical in this community or you know, otherwise. So Jordi, what about on the new meadows? Has it, has it gotten busier? What have you seen since you started there and what yeah. the changes like? Well, and I would say for the new meadows, but also just with my main island trail hat on, I think that the coast in general is definitely, especially over the last two or three years, like the mm -hmm. pandemic has certainly increased the boating traffic. Um, you know, I think that there's more people coming to Maine now. Um, I think that there are more boats out on the water that, than there ever were before. I know MCFA and MIDA, you know, we we're working together on trying to come up with ways just to help get the message out about being responsible, caring about everything around you. And I think that, um, so yes, the traffic is up. We actually have the numbers to prove it. We track uh, Jewel Island and Little Shabig Island, which granted they're right off of Portland. We actually have caretakers there. That summer of 2020 was a huge spike in the numbers. It's come back down a little bit, but still on a steady uh, increase. And I think that this whole idea of having kind of open dialogue and discussion is very much uh, the way to go. And everybody just realizing that if, if you can kind of be friendly to your neighbor out there on the water, you're going to, you're going to have a lot more fun for everyone. So, so following in, in that terms, other than slowing down, we talked yeah. about speed, yep. what would be one thing that you wish more people sort of knew and took into consideration when they were out in the water? For me personally, it would be nice if more people were familiar with the general, you know, how with the Coast Guard, they call it the rules of the road, um, which is, I think that not everybody Clearly, Maine, you don't have to take any type of boat or safety course. You can get your boat and go for it. Um, there are definitely some things where, even if it's not necessarily that you have to slow down, because maybe you're in an open body of water, you're both just crossing each other, but just knowing, like, hey, typically, you know, we cross port to port or whatever. I think that there would be more of those type of things that it would be nice if everybody had a general idea of just like, you know, if we're coming at each other, I'm going to 
turn a little bit more to starboard so that you know this is the way I'm going. It'd be nice if you did that. We'll leave each other a little bit more room. Um, so some of those, and I'm a little jaded. I used to, uh, I have a hundred ton. I used to captain the wind jammers down at the main state pier for about six years. And so I've done a lot of sailing as well. Um, and I think that down there, it is so much more packed than it is here. Like when I was captaining those, I'm sailing an 80 foot sailboat around other boats, around ferries, around fishermen, you know, and I, I'm, you're just weaving your way through because people down there are setting traps that have, you know, strings of seven on them. Then you get the ferry boats coming in, you know, you get the, the fire boats running out and everything. And it's a very busy place, but it's just much more that like having a good general idea of like, what are the, as they call it, the kind of the rules of the road. And I, it'd be nice if people did, there's some really good, just quick boater safety courses that are well worth the time too. So. Where do people find those? Is that something we could make available more readily? We could share as a resource after yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some, yeah, you know, the Power Squadron is great. The, the Coast Guard's actually, yeah, they've got a lot of good stuff, as you said, yeah. Sometimes you can, uh, you can find out there's a course that's just one evening. Yep. You know, it's not. Yep. Like, it doesn't have to be, right, the whole yeah, thing. Like three or four days or anything like that. Yeah. It's just one day. One, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I will pass on one other thing. When, when you're trying to get your lobster license, you have to pass a uh, open ocean survival course. Did you do that? Uh, I have not yet, no. Uh, I, I did it last year. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on getting my, my commercial license back yeah. because I gave it up and moved to Florida uh, for a while. Anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but I did it last winter. And uh, anybody, it's 250 bucks, I think. It's not that expensive. And you spend a whole day with a guy that really knows what's going on. He's a teacher down at Maine Maritime Academy, my alma mater, actually. And, uh, oh, nice. uh, and he, he's very good. He teaches you how to use your survival equipment. And one of the things that I have learned from him was that they have individual GPSs now. If you're any, doing any uh, uh, boating that takes you a little ways away from shore where you can't see land, where you might fall overboard or where it's foggy or... You might have engine try all kinds of different reasons, but I wear that right on my on my suspenders. It's up on my chest here. It's about that big. My wife bought it for me for Christmas last year, and that is actually a personal EPRO. So if I'm if I'm knocked over or fall overboard or whatever, uh, or even if I just had a heart attack or whatever in the boat, I can just put the antenna up and and hold it out from under the, any overhead and it will send a signal to the Coast Guard and tell them exactly where I am. It's like the big EPR that they have out there, but it's this big. It's the size of a, nobody even knows what a cigarette package is anymore like this, but it's, it's the size a cigarette package used to be. And it, and it goes here and it, it's really, they, they talked about that in the survival course and, uh, um, and it just made me more aware of how cold the water is. I've known all my life it's freezing cold. You don't have much of a chance if it's if, if, if you go overboard. But yeah. the, the, the uh, EPIRB will help find. Yeah, you know, EPIRB find stands out. for Emergency Positioning Indicator Radio Beacon. And all commercial fishing vessels also have to have them as well. Um, I think we have a Zoom question. Yeah, we'll send an email afterwards with some resources. So, okay. hard to gauge with 216 miles of coastline it's, yeah i think <laughs> at least in this part of the coast it's definitely yeah. kind of done like west bath our harbor master kind of is out there puttering around and you know if he sees you he'll definitely talk to you and i think it is yeah. at least down here in this neck of the woods yeah. definitely more the so. marine patrol try to go to areas where there's problems yeah and most of the marine patrol spends their weekends on the Saco river yeah they're not so much time here yeah because I mean, they have so much drinking there and crowsing and people getting in fights and falling overboard and all of that kind of stuff. 
So that's an inland river up in Freiburg area, you know, and that's where most of our Marine Patrol officers spend their weekends and stuff is on the big weekends up there, rather than patrolling down here where they're needed also. But really kind of left to patrol ourselves down. Yeah. You know, when they do come down, they're very helpful, but they don't, there's just not enough. Of them. Yeah, there's definitely not, it's definitely a capacity issue. And I would say that that's, like I was joking about that with 216 miles of coastline, but we do, we have one harbor master and especially in the summertime, there's issues on the water, but there's also issues on the boat ramps and, and other places too that need attention. So I think someone, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Is it that when they're preparing the loud or coming back and being out all night long, and it's still like three or four in the morning and it's still dark, and the bright, bright lights that can be out there, because you see them at night, you know, 11, 12 o'clock, even though it's mm -hmm. dark, so, so they come back and then they keep the lights on all the time. Well, for those lights, is that the curfew that dim them, or do they need those lights? Safety. Yep. So we don't actually have a big squid fishery. So they're probably, if you see boats coming in at night with lights on, they're probably just coming in from lobstering. A lot of squid fishing that would happen around here is right actually just off the wharf. People put the lights out and they just kind of catch them. Um, but lights are. No. 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 They can lobster right up until dark. Yeah. They, they yeah. So they could be, you know, a few miles offshore or more and then finish up their day and then come in at night and they'll have their lights on. And that that's definitely for safety purposes. Yeah. I think if you're talking about off of Seguin, off that area, is that what you're looking at? Yeah. Out to the east of that area? Yeah, they're probably, a lot of my heron fish. It could be other. Because they're midwater trawling for heron. And the heron come up in, at night and where they can get them and they drop down on the bottom uh, during the day. And so that's what a lot of those guys are doing out there. And then, but I think they do scallop drag. They do, night. do yeah. some scallops in the yeah. winter time. Yep. During the winter months, yeah. Yep. And that's not, well, I don't know if they would be off here as much as they are down around Portland. And They're generally offshore quite a bit. Yeah. Flats and new legs and stuff like that. Yeah. Sure. Do we have another Zoom? Okay. Every time, and I always forget. I'm so sorry, people on Zoom. I'm so sorry. Um, I wanted to keep talking a little bit about safety, though, because I think that's a big one, because whether we're talking about speed or going in the right direction, I mean, that's really what we're thinking about, right, is just keeping everybody safe um, on the water. What do you think some of the other things that people kind of miss when they're out on the water? like? Um, kayakers without life vests, that kind uh, of thing. You see that, and you see also this, the boards, what do they call them? Stand-up paddle boards. Yeah, Stand up paddle boards. I'm not even sure what the law is. I, I think I see people with their life jackets on the paddle board and they're not wearing it. Now, I don't know, frankly, I don't know if that's legal or not. Or if they, and they're supposed to actually have them on, but I was, I think that kayakers and canoes and all that sort of thing have to be wearing their life jacket to be legal. Well, uh, <laughs> well they're not required in Maine to wear them at all, I guess. <laughs> I know, I know, I understand. Uh, but uh, one of the things that uh, uh, people with kayaks have got to understand is that uh, large boats, like large lobster boats and even just uh, recreational boats, you're a very small target for the kayak. Uh, you, it looks, I mean, even when they're bright orange or, you know, bright green or whatever, uh, if you're 70 yards away or something like that, you may not even see that person until you're a great deal closer because when the waves are moving, they're down in one and you're up in another, or, or you're down in one and they're down in one, you don't see them at all. And you can, you can come up onto somebody in the kayak very quickly sometimes. And so you get, it's, 
It's like trying to see a log out there or something. It's almost impossible to see a log floating because it's like right at the surface. But, um, and unfortunately, your lobster fishermen unintentionally are not paying a great deal of attention to what's directly in front of them. They're, they're interested in where they're setting their traps, how far off the ledges they are. They're looking at their fathometer, you know, to put lobster traps where they want them to be. You know, so they have a lot going on besides, they're not just skylocking and looking around. No. They've, got, they've got a lot going on to, yep. to be watching for. Joss, have, have you had any encounters with kayaks or have they made you nervous before? Or? Um, I feel like kayaks, uh, they do make me a little nervous only because they are so small. Um, and I would feel really bad if something were to have fortunately to happened to a kayaker and I didn't see them or anything like that. Um, some kayakers do get a little close, but I make sure that like I, I see them and like they see me so that I can make sure that we're both safe. Um, I haven't had many kayakers come very close to me. Um, I've been okay for the, for the most part. Um, but yeah, I, I'm definitely looking around for kayakers and paddle mortars and other boats just to make sure that we're all safe on the water. What about when you're menhaden fishing with dad? Have they gotten close um, or? Kayakers, uh, I don't think I've ever seen any kayakers while I've been uh, hoagie fishing. I don't think. Okay. No. I have a sailboat, a cruise, and a lot of my friends, especially the ones that come up from down south, uh, they're, they're frightened by the lines of the lobster. And I think I've seen in many cases, if you pay attention to the sailboat, you can find a track so that both of them are on one side or the other working for you. Is that consciously done so that you can get your own boat through, or do they just <laughs> Every inboard lobster boat that you find will have a cage around its propeller. The keels are deep, just like the, uh, our lobster boats were originally sailboats, and they were designed as sailboats with very deep oak keels. And when they when they finally put motors in them and stuff, that's how they came up with the Hampton style boat, which is our current style of lobster boats. And so coming off our keel is a stainless steel cage around the propeller so that I can go right over the top of the buoy and it just slides on by. And quite frankly, this is my own opinion. Most people probably don't agree with it. And certainly most sailors wouldn't agree with it. But I feel that a vessel out there that's got a propeller that doesn't have a cage shouldn't be allowed. Because when you get wound up in somebody's gear out there, you're costing him $100 a trap when you cut him off. Or more. And, or more. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Not my traps. If there's lobsters my traps in them. And, and they cost me 100 bucks a piece. But, but uh, so, and I, I mean, I've seen people do horrendous things. And I'm not blaming just sailors. But I've been, I've been over in the basin, uh, which is, the basin is over in the uh, New Meadows River. Uh, and uh, we saw we were over there pokey fishing a few years back and uh, setting a seine. And this, let, this man had, on a sailboat had a winch to haul his anchor up. And when he pulled it up, he had probably towed a little bit. He had two or three lines wrapped around it. And his wife went up front and she had a big pair of clippers and she just clipped them all off. I'm not, I don't know if it was his wife, a lady, went up and just clipped them all with no care about the fact that this guy has just lost several days income because somebody has just yeah. cut him away. Uh, it's illegal to do that. And uh, if you, on most hull lobster boats, the cage probably drops you down one knot from your hull speed. And, but that's not a big deal with us lobster fishermen, but it's a real big deal for sailors. They think that one knot is gonna make them never get where they're gonna go. And when you talk to a lot of <laughs> sailors about putting cages on their, uh, on their wheels, uh, they would be so much less hassle, you know, than running over, getting a, getting a lobster, uh, you know, a string of 14 or 15 traps wrapped around your stern post on a, on a sailboat can be disastrous out there. You know, so to answer your question too, though, about the lobster traps, they don't set them so that other people can get by. They set them 
ledges, mud, they're looking at the bottom where the lobsters are and, and things like that. Um, Generally, they all are set in the same directions, the ledges. Yeah. Where did I, Heather, did you have a question? I saw your hand. That's a, that's that an can definitely point. make a difference. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jay. Susan, did you have a? That's a great idea. And um, like we said, after this, when we send the resources, these little tips, we'll try to include them as well. Just, you know, if you want to share it with your friends too, about, you know, things that they can be doing to stay safe on the, on the water. What do you, what are some of the things that you and your brother do to make sure that you're safe when you're out on the water? Um, well, for one, we make sure our feet are out of the way of rope. Um, I, I, me being the captain on the boat, I make sure that my head is on a swivel pretty much, um, making sure that our feet and our hands and like the traps and everything are going in the right spot. And then just to be aware of other boats and everything and also buoys, um, because I do have an outboard, so I can't have a cage. I have actually ran over my own buoy one time. Uh, don't ask me how I did that. Uh, <laughs> that, that was my bad. Um, but so... I just yeah. Do you yell at your brother when he's not paying attention? Um. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I know the answer. Yes. <laughs> I don't think I yell that that much. Uh, he, he does pretty good because he knows that I'm kind of like the boss and I I know what I'm doing for the most part. I have to say I, I meant that jokingly, but I'm pretty impressed with my kids when they're out on the water because. They might argue and be pains when I'm around and we're on land, but I think if they're on their own boat or on the boat with their dad, they recognize that they have to be paying attention and they have to listen to the captain because the ocean and being on the water is a very fast changing place. Um, and I like the way you put that. I'm sure your head on the swivel is definitely the, the right way to do it. Jordy, but what about like when you are attending your oyster cages and stuff? Are there safety things that you're keeping in mind? Yeah, well, and I would say even oystering or not oystering, I think one of the big things that not everybody does is bringing along proper gear and equipment. You know, the Coast Guard doesn't even require people to have an anchor on board. And so I think, you know, as, as a boater, just knowing that you have kind of all the things with you that you can help yourself be sufficient. So if it's, you know... Anchor, flares, sound producing devices, life jackets. I wear a life jacket every time I go boating still. I've got a 10 and an eight year old. I have a really light, easy to put on PFD. It's one of the hydrostatic inflatable ones. Um, I doing it to set a good example for my kids. But at the same time, if I get hit in the head and fall overboard, if I don't have it on, I'm dead. Um, you know, so I think that is it the most comfortable when I'm oystering and it kind of bumps in the way, like I can tighten it in so it's not too bad. But I think there's a lot of really good equipment. You were talking about the e or survival suits, but I think that there's a lot of, in today's day and age, the equipment is very good and it's worth getting it. It's expensive, but like I even keep, you know, um, the space blankets on board. I'm, I have a little Grady white, 21 foot Grady white with a cutty cab and, you know, down below, I keep some food, I keep some water. I think having that kind of stuff for safety sake is definitely well worth it. Um, that said, yeah, so oystering in particular, like I'm wearing my Grundens because it is dirty, messy, stinky work. Uh, but yes, still have on a life jacket, still trying to pay attention to what's going on. You know, what we're kind of doing out there, people are always wondering, like, what are you actually doing when you're on the oyster farm? The oysters are filter feeders. So they're naturally feeding. They can, a full-size oyster can filter about 50 gallons of water a day. So they are constantly feeding. Uh, that said, you know, when they feed, 
They're also excreting, so you're cleaning that off. You get marine growth. Think about like the bottom of your boat, how it will get a little bit of growth on the bottom. And that's with anti-fouling paint. Think about if you don't have any of that on there, um, you know, we're constantly cleaning bags, cages, shaking our oysters so that they don't start to grow together. Um, and so I think that, you know, we're always, as you say, you know, you're kind of like looking down and doing your thing, but definitely having the proper just gear on board with you um, makes a lot of sense. And the Coast Guard only requires a few things, but there's some other good things to have with you as well. And what about with your, literally you have your MITA hat on, but what about with your MITA hat on? Is there something that you talk to your, <laughs> is there something you talk to your members about when they're traversing, going out on the trails and stuff yeah. and they're on the islands? Yeah, I think one of the big things for that, well, regarding the, regarding etiquette for, especially I would say for where Main Island Trail stands, like we really try to teach leave no trace and just being a responsible steward. Um, so if you're going out and you're using an island, leaving it a better place than when you got there. So it's kind of like cleaning up after yourself. Plus, if you see somebody else's trash, like you can bring it with you or let us know and we can, we can organize a big cleanup. Um, but I think it's very much uh, one of those. I think, as Susan said and others have said with kayaking, it's doing things to make yourself more visible. You are a speed bump for most people out there. And I say that I don't really kayak a whole lot. Uh, I'm in an organization that has probably, maybe not quite half our members are kayakers, but then again, the other half of them are power boaters, sail boaters, or even non-boaters. Um, but I think that, yeah, making yourself visible is really huge and, and just being responsible and respectful of your environment around you. Those are good ones. Kate, is there somebody right behind you? And then I'll get, go ahead, Kate. And that's where well said. I would definitely say that taking that even quick one day course or whatever will go over a lot of that kind of stuff, which is really helpful to know because there are kind of, if you will, right and wrong ways to do things out there. And it, the more people that kind of, it's just like driving a car, but if you've never done it before, you've never gotten a license, it would be kind of mayhem out there on the highway. Yeah. Sorry. I think that would be a call to the harbor master. Yeah, I would call the harbor master. You, you could call, probably call the harbor master and let him yeah. make him aware of it that there's an obstruction out there. Right? Well, then there's a lot of it going on right now because you got a full moon high tides. Tide. Yeah, you got big tides, and so a lot of that stuff is drifting off. Especially, yeah, and then we had a lot of blowdown this winter too. Yeah. 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 Well, one other thing I would just say, uh, the lady that mentioned the antenna that uh, the flag she puts on her kayak. Heather. Uh, I belong to the Boys Bailey Yacht Club, and we have, I don't know, there was a bunch of people that were getting into kayaks probably five or ten years ago. And interested in doing it because it's a great way to get out on the water. It's a reasonably expensive, inexpensive boat to get out and do something that gives you some exercise and that sort of thing. So it's, you know, a lot of people like doing it. But what we did is we started talking about, you know, kids riding bicycles have a flag on the back of their bicycle, you know, so that see cars can see them and so forth. And so we got they, they got some two by fours and just drilled a hole in them. And they took these uh, little red flags that, that belong on bicycles and they stuck them in the, in the hole and then they just bungee corded that to the kayak. And when they're using, uh, storing the kayak and putting it somewhere, 
it, pull, it pulls right down tight and they can you know, lay it right alongside. So it's not a, in the problem when they're transporting that kayak. Well, the minute these ladies get in the water with these things, up goes their little flag. And you'll see our yacht club people because there'll be five or six of them together and they all got their little orange flag up in the air. <laughs> so it's really a good thing because it's six up high enough. If you've never been on a lobster boat, a lot of lobster boat, you can barely see over the bow. You're looking out further. And uh, I almost hit somebody right at the dock one day. And when I started to pull away from the dock, I heard a scream and it was a lady in a kayak and she was hanging on to the, uh, the bow ring on my boat, resting. And I had no idea she was there, you know? And so, <laughs> you know, I just, I couldn't believe it. I was so angry with her. <laughs> she heard words she probably hadn't heard before, but, but she, she didn't, she just didn't understand. You know that that she was putting herself in a really danger. You know, I mean, people don't walk around their boat and check to me. They probably should, maybe they should. You know? yeah. yeah. But it was a dangerous situation, and and I don't want to sound as though I blame kayaks for all all the incidents and stuff because I don't. But they, they just need to share some of the responsibility. And like my daughter that just spoke back there uh, mentioned, the restricted to the channel. You have to realize that a lot of places, these lobster boats, particularly coming through the, the uh, Oars Bale Island Bridge or the Oars Great Island Bridge, that lobster boat has to stay in that channel. He can't get halfway through the bridge and change his mind. And if you come around the corner, that, that's one of the problems I have with the kayak is they oftentimes will come down and dart around the corner and then bang, you're halfway through the bridge. The current's running quite fast out. So six, six or eight knots current through that bridge and you have to power up to get through it and here's a kayak coming down on you and the only thing you're going to do is if you turn sideways you're probably going to bump your bow or your stern on the bridge itself and that bridge isn't going anywhere so it's a really kind of a dangerous area and the only thing I can say to kayakers is when you get where you can look through and see nobody coming get through as quickly as possible and then move over out of the channel and that way you won't have, the, have an incident there. Um, I was going to switch gears a little bit. It just, it kind of came to mind as everybody was talking and that is, um, we didn't really talk about swimming. We don't necessarily think about swimming all the time because um, I still think it's cold, um, but it is an issue. And as we know in Harpswell too, sharks are now an issue as well. Have you thought about that in your business? Yeah. And I know you've thought about it because I've, I worried because that was right near where you fish too. Is that something that you keep in mind now or how, like where the shark was and stuff? Oh, um, there's been a, a couple of shark sightings uh, by Pond Island, which is where I have some of my traps. Um, I guess it worries me when I think about it, but when I don't think about it, I'm okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, that is pretty scary. Um, I, I don't know how fast sharks can swim, but um, I have a feeling I could maybe get away from it. Um, I don't think they're going to necessarily come after my boat. Um, I mean, yeah, that would be very scary to, to see a shark, um, but I feel like it would be a little cool too. Um, yeah, um, I no, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, in the movie Jaws, I guess it does, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, that was a tragic thing that happened here. Absolutely. But, it's, but I personally predicted it for many years because of the number of seals we have now. When 50 years ago when I was a youngster, or even before that, seals were killed and there was a, uh, a bounty on them paid for by the state because they were considered... Uh, uh, adverse to our fishing industry and so forth. I'm not saying that's what we need to do now. I'm just saying that there's a lot more seals now. And when, in fact, I was out today and um, even the gray seals have got back here from up north already. And uh, they have whelps or babies with them. And they can be quite dangerous. If you were swimming, don't ever swim near seals or where there's baby seals. Yes, yeah. she, 
yeah, she literally could not have looked more like a seal if she'd been tried. And that's an unfortunate thing. But you have to bear in mind that there has never been a shark attack in Maine waters prior to that. And that's the only one that's ever been here. But if you go out to Halfway Rock, for instance, just where the lighthouse is out here, there's two to 300 seals on that ledge all the time. Mm -hmm. And when they're going to the bathroom and stuff, that the current's carrying that scent to the south, because we're, we, uh, water travels to the south through here. And those shacks, they're not coming up here on vacation. They're coming up here because they smell seals and they, they want a meal out of it. Well, and I think that goes to, you know, much like if you're on the boat paying attention to what's going on around you, shortly after that happened, Maine Coast Fishermen's Association actually wrote something for the town of Harpswell, how to spot fish, which I know sounds sort of silly, we all know, but like Jay said, being aware of seals and schools of fish, listening for splashes in the water and looking out into the water for where it's sort of shimmering and there's flipping, it's pogey season right now. So there's a lot of schools of fish that drive the seals yeah. and things like that. And so whether it's on the boat or if you're swimming, sort of paying attention to those types of things and even the water temperatures as well. I get nervous about, you know, if it's not July or August and I see someone in a kayak that doesn't necessarily have a life vest, my first thought too is just if they fall in, they're going to be very cold and I hope they can make it to shore. We do live in Maine, um, so it can get pretty cold. So on that note, I did want to, um, let's switch season real quick. I hadn't even thought about this, but like, what about winter time on the water? You're not as busy in the winter on the water. No, not, not carrying passengers, but I will be because I'm starting an oyster bed myself. Nice. Uh, so it's, uh, it's getting to be a very popular thing. I think the last I heard there were, uh, something like 70 oyster farms in Casco Bay. Yeah. Uh, no, in Hartsville waters yeah, alone. Yeah. And because I was speak speaking to the uh, Mr. Plummer, the harbor master, and he says it's not, it's a real pain in the neck for him because he's got to deal with all of yeah. these people that are putting these, uh, they're unlit. Uh, and they, I think there's going to be some more things coming down the pike about. Uh, how these uh, oyster beds should be maintained so that anybody out at night will know they're there. Um, there's a lot of, there's a few things that need to be tweaked on that to make it safer for boaters and make it safer for the people that own them also. Um, they, they did change it all to yellow buoys on them yeah. um, after I bought all white ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think they, I think they're, lights, well, they could have lights possibly. They could have blinking lights on them. You know, this, this, I think there's, maybe there'll be some legislature come along that, that looks at it from the boaters' point of view. Uh, usually where the oyster beds are, are in fairly unnavigable water, except by kayaks or something. It's well, yeah, I, shallow. Mean, I can, at low tide, I can walk to my farm. It's yeah. literally five, four, four feet deep at, at low tide. So, and I think a lot of, one of the stipulations that the Harbor Master will require of you to do a farm is that it has to be outside of a channel and outside of kind of navigable waterways. That said, as farms get larger, you know, they, they but they're still supposed to try to make sure that that's one of the things and they're supposed to try to not do it in, you know, areas where there's a lot of lobster fishing. One of the things that I would say as a farmer, like I know a lot of the people that haul traps around me and I actually now tell them like, put their traps right around my farm. My farm's not moving. I'm continually knocking biofouling to the bottom. Lobsters eat the nastiest stuff they can off the bottom. And I've got a few different guys that'll drop their traps in and around it because mine's a pretty static thing. It's not gonna move. 
And they've had pretty good luck catching lobsters around there. So the more that even like in that sense, uh, you know, lobstermen and oyster farmers and everybody out on the water can kind of work together, it's going to be a more positive experience, I think, for yeah, everyone. Another question. Okay, you're, you're uh, <laughs> only one example I can give with the rest of the Northeast Harbor last year. And there were lots, I mean, in Northeast Harbor, it's many times, large river, large boats. And there were lots sort of between the boats. And, and in one particular case, sort of wrapped around the moorings, so there's a sign to a guy next to you, just off of that. I mean, is this, is there any restrictions on where we're talking No. And uh, that goes back quite a ways with that sort of thing, too. Uh, I, I've seen sometimes where lobster fishermen have set traps in mooring areas and so forth, uh, anchorages, special anchorages, and that sort of thing. I don't think there's anything to prevent some, but they're taking a chance of losing their gear, you know, and uh, which is too bad. It, but, you know, um, the, the fisherman's got to take responsibility for that. I, I see traps in the gut and it, uh, practically under the, well, I, once in a while you see a trap right underneath the Oars Bailey Island Bridge. I mean, in the open. And there's no way that- you Can't get around that. <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna get around that. You know? And if the tide's running, you don't know where the line is particularly. Somebody asked about seeing traps. And I, I teach, a lot of boaters, I, I had kind of a deal with New Menace Marina and when they sell a new boat to somebody and they say, well, is there somebody around that can show me around? Uh, they give them my name and I'll take them out and, and show them the New Menace River and, and that sort of thing and how to get to Cunny's Harbor and so forth and how to use their safety gear. And I kind of give them a little boating lesson and so forth. And one of the things that I teach them is that you never want to go by the pointy end of the boot. You want to try to go around the square end or where the spindle is sticking up. And because that's the way the tide is running. And by going behind it, you're actually not going to cut across the uh, end where the line is. That's just kind of a basic thing to go by. It's not going to work every time, but it's going to help. So let me ask you this now. Why do people farther east do spots? Because they get cut off. I don't know why we did. There's a lot of the things those people down east do. That we don't do, <laughs> including shooting each other. On the hey, 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 hey. Not going there. Not going there. <laughs> do we have other questions about some etiquette on the water from the audience? About go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that uh, fishermen are you know, fascinating, and what they're doing is really interesting. Uh, there's a possible thing I can I watch and appreciate what they're doing without. Uh, like from a kayak or from well joss i'm gonna let you answer that how far off would you want someone to be while you were hauling to feel like they were safe um i'm not very good with distances but um far enough away that both of us could know we're both there and both might not hit each other have time to react. Yeah, and have time to react. So I'm like, you know, five boats or more. That's, I mean, it's a hundred feet if it's your boat. Yeah, that yeah. seems that seems pretty good to me. I I, I think. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you just sit it. Yeah. And yeah. You know, if you're not if you're not changing your position, the fisherman knows you, will know you're yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, guys who are second nets and stuff like that, I like to watch and things. But having to go catch points, you know, all that kind of. When yeah. when people are setting nets like first seining, yeah. stay way away. Yeah, that yeah, that's way, a, because way, if you spook way. the fish, they're going to be really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not worried about safety. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're worried about encircling those yeah. those fish, and they can be spooked very easily. So just stay, you know, a hundred yards away from this. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I ask, I, excuse me, but when I take my lobster fishermen out a lot, I don't fish, I mean, my uh, clients out a lot, I don't fish strings. So I'll oftentimes will watch somebody that's setting a string of traps and I'll set 50 feet, I mean, 50 yards to hundred yards away. From, and I'll explain, this is how, you know, bigger fishermen than myself 
uh, dropping net traps because they it's like they're running down a road and they come flying off the end there. That's, yeah. that's the way it's done. So, Kate, did you have a question? Yeah, good point. Good point. Thank you, Kate. Go ahead. You're not supposed to touch. Are you talking about like if you find them on the beach or something like that? Well, they're not yours. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm not being uh, glib, but I see cottages in different places with hundreds of buoys hanging in front of their house. Maybe they think that, you know, the fishermen will see them and come knock on a door and take them back, but they don't. And uh, it does clean the place up, but the, really the law is it's that that's somebody else's gear and you're not supposed to touch it. I have buoys on my garage. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? No. Well, no. dump. So now with, <laughs> well, with Maine Island Trail Association, because we do cleanups, uh, especially, you know, we'll, we do it up and down the coast, but we, what we'll do is obviously derelict traps, buoys that are busted and or good ones. We will go out, we'll do it, but first we'll coordinate with the DMR. We'll coordinate with the local authorities and that way we can go and do it. And then we know where there's a drop site that we can get rid of them. Is So... You know, if you if you find them and and they're in good working order, you could all you could report it to the your harbor master, and they might be psyched to get their lobster buoy back. Especially some of those ones are pretty expensive. So if it's in good shape, definitely. But that's how we do it with Maine Island Trails. We actually coordinate it with the DMR, uh, the Marine Patrol, and uh, the lobster fishing being held to a much higher standing as far as getting rid of their old gear too, their traps and stuff. Uh, you're supposed to take them to a dump. You, you have to take the weights out of them before you take them to the dump so they can be crushed. And then in this town, the town sells them for the metal weight because they're all wire traps. But uh, so there is some issues, some things uh, that fishermen can do. They don't just cut their old traps off and let them sink to the bottom because then they become a problem for, for themselves as much as anybody else. Mm -hmm. Were there any Zoom questions? I just want to start to... We'll probably do one or two more questions if anybody has anything or even a story that they'd like to share of a run in this summer. Go ahead, Susan. Good point. Jocelyn, why don't you tell us how you tag all of your traps with, I happen to have one on my fist, and then how your buoys have numbers. <laughs> um, so every year when we buy our licenses, um, we go on online and buy those. And along with our license, we also have to buy um, our trap tags. I personally have 150 because uh, that's how many traps I'm able to have. And what we do is there's on my traps, and I'm pretty sure most everybody else is, there's like two bars in the middle of the trap, and I just wrap it around one of those. Um, and it has the year that it is, um, your number, and uh, the number of the number of tag it is. So like I have my tags are numbered one through one hundred and fifty um, in your zone, and in, in my zone apparently. Um, and so those go on the traps. So if you find them, you can actually figure out who that is. Um, somebody might really want that back. Um, on our buoys as well, it also has our lobster um, license number on it. So you can also find out who's buoy or trap that is by that number. You can call the DMR and they'll, and they'll yeah. tell you. Who, and then who, who, who I know it them. sounds silly too, but if you have a Facebook page, sometimes just putting it on there, somebody can see it and it will let somebody know like, hey, I found this lobster trap. Mm -hmm. So Kate. With the cleanup of their gear? Ghost gear. In general, 
um, that their responsibility, I mean, nobody wants to lose traps. And so they do usually try to find them if they've been cut for some reason or lost in the water, they'll grapple for them. If they end up on beaches, they want to find them. Uh, like Jordy said, organizations like MIDA will have cleanups. Um, we try to get fishermen to participate. Um, that's not always easy because their first goal was always fishing. Um, is that kind of what you had in mind? That kind of... Yeah, yeah. I think um, we re definitely rely on organizations like MIDA to help kind of make that happen more, especially like out in the islands um, and things like that. For a long time. Well, exactly. I mean, your intention is never to lose them. A lobsterman never wants to lose their gear. So if it ends up someplace, something has happened for that to happen. Um, and we could probably do a better job um, as an industry cleaning up, but it's hard if we don't know that they're there either. Um, so Marianne, did you have? Yeah, so I, I don't know if we still have that, so I wasn't going to mention it, but when we send around the resources and stuff later, I, I'll uh, probably four years ago, five years ago, the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association actually worked with um, Chuck Pirro at the transfer station, and we um, did a NIFWIF project, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, to have a dumpster placed at the Harpswell transfer station that was specifically for uh, lobster gear, and I believe it might still be there. Um, and if it is, I'll make sure that that gets um, passed around. It was a, one of those things we had to re-up every year, but I think Chuck's done a great job um, keeping stuff up down there. Uh, so it might still be available. If you have a five trap license, uh, like you were speaking of, you're not gonna find your license number on those tags. The only people that have their license number on them are people like Josh and the commercial fishermen that have up to 800 traps. Right what is it now? 800 yeah. in most zones, 600 in one so, zone. But on the uh, recreational traps, they, they have numbers and stuff on them, but usually they don't have your license number yeah. on it. Was there a Zoom question? Um, I, I think I admit, so, so they, they watched a lobster trap lose gear. Hmm. Oh, this is a derelict boat or something that was. I'm not sure they can, we can, if they can find my email address, maybe I can help them kind of figure something out. If they, if they can get the tag number off the trap. I would say the contact with the MR. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good. I think that's good. Yeah. Oh, the local have them. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any uh, final question or comment before we wrap up this evening? Are there still snacks and stew available? I hope people grab stuff on their way out. Um, but if not, thank you very much, so much. Oh, I actually had one more thing. Yeah. I had one more thing, it's okay. 
So Jordy, you made mention of this real quick, but we are working on a campaign um, with our colleagues. It's the Maine Island Trail Association, Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, Maine Marine Trades Association, and Friends of Casco Bay. We have a hashtag campaign, uh, hashtag love Maine waters. Um, so if you're taking pictures out on the islands or in the water this summer and you're posting them places, please use that. You can find in more information at all of our organizations. Hopefully there'll be some press about it in the coming weeks. Um, we're really trying to elevate the conversations around loving Maine waters and all um, you know, the shared spaces and, and celebrating being on the water in Maine. So keep an eye out for that. And I just wanted to thank all of the partners again that is putting on this series all of our great panel members and we'll be sending around um, Julia at the land trust does a great job always sending follow up after these and we'll make sure to include some of the resources and things that we talked about this evening so thank you all so much for coming. Thanks.